Good morning and welcome back to Mornings in Matthew, our daily Bible study series through the book of Matthew. And we are in our final video, uh, video 31, I believe, and chapter 28 today. Uh, so thank you so much to all of you who have um, been through this series with us as we've gone through every verse in Matthew. I do hope you found it helpful and beneficial to your own faith as you continue to seek God through his word. We're going to be finishing chapter 27 because I left a, a few chunks of that and we're going to finish 28 and conclude our study through the book of Matthew today. So let's dive in and see what God has for us today. So in 27 verse 57, I'll start there. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance uh, to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Okay, so as evening approaches... Uh, we, we know this is on the um, Friday, uh, the, the leading up to the start of the Sabbath day would be on Friday night at sunset and Sabbath would go all the way from Friday night through to Saturday evening at sunset. And that then would mark the first day of the week, which is actually Sunday as, as far as the, the Jewish calendar is concerned. Uh, but here Joseph of Arimathea uh, asks Pilate for the body, takes the body and places it in his own tomb. Uh, being a wealthy man, he would have had a tomb, perhaps a family burial plot, uh, but he, he has Jesus buried there. Let's carry on reading. Verse 62. Uh, the next day, the one after the preparation day, okay, so the next day being set, preparation day being preparation for the Sabbath, leading up to that Friday evening, the next day now being Saturday, uh, it says, chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the orders for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So again, the Pharisees not only wanted to kill Jesus, but also squash any thoughts of, of his movement, of his uprising, um, of the thoughts of his kingdom. They wanted his name tarnished. They wanted him completely got away, got rid of. So they want to minimize any risk that any of the disciples were even going to come and steal the body and pretend that he's risen and, and, and this kind of thing. So they make the tomb extra secure. They get a Roman guard posted there. It's covered with a Roman seal, which means if you were to remove it, you would be doing so with your own life because the Romans would kill you for that. But they're, they're guarding the tomb as securely as they know how. And whilst they're trying to prevent any kind of uh, conspiracy, this actually just makes it even more amazing. Um, Jesus raising the death, death and actually makes it even more implausible. Um, some of the lies that we see um, or the other explanations like this, that the disciples came and stole the body. But more on that in just a moment. In chapter 28, verse 1, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So again, first day of the week, now being Sunday. Um, and again, Christians celebrate um, on a Sunday. We meet for church on Sunday, the first day of the week. We know also from Acts 20, verse 7, this was the practice of the early Christians. Uh, but let's carry on reading. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, 
now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see him. Uh, sorry, there they will see me. We see the risen Jesus. He has conquered death. He has overcome the world. He's paid the ultimate price to free us from the bondage and slavery of sin. He's died on the cross, buried in a tomb. But now we see him risen from the grave, risen to new life and also to offer us that new life. Um, what an incredible moment this is. What a defining moment in our faith as Christians, uh, the faith of the disciples. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, our faith would be futile. We would still be in our sins. The resurrection of Jesus is a defining moment. It is a crucial moment in the Christian faith. Without it, you can't remove the resurrection from Christianity and have its substance remain. If there is no resurrection, then, then our faith is meaningless. It has nothing to base itself upon. It is the fact that Jesus conquered sin and rose from the dead that he is able to offer us new life. And that in him, we can have eternal life and also be raised from the dead ourselves. So this is a defining and crucial moment. But there's a few interesting things I often like to point out. Now, now again, and, and we'll see this in just a moment, um, they, they actually, I, I mentioned that just in just a moment about the, the false report of, of um, the disciples stealing the body. But another interesting thing here, if you were making this story up, and if we were just, just creating some kind of fictional story, uh, you wouldn't have women be the first witnesses to the tomb, um, to the empty tomb. Uh, a woman's, unfortunately, a woman's testimony in this culture just ha carried less weight. In fact, it wasn't even legally allowed in a court of law. So again, you're making it up. You don't have women be the first witnesses. You, are, you would have someone else uh, be those witnesses. But let's carry on reading in verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this day. Uh, not only would these soldiers be in serious trouble, um, they, they most likely would be paying with their lives. But the chief priests here uh, go to the governor and, and smooth this over in some way. They pay them off. Um, this, what they were trying to prevent, this idea that the disciples would come and steal his body because they just believed Jesus to be a deceiver and they were trying to get rid of him. Actually, the complete opposite has been true. Jesus is the son of God. He is the Messiah. He has raised from the dead. And now they're trying to find some other solution to this. So they now get these soldiers to lie and say the disciples came and stole the body. And again, there's so many, there will be so many things wrong with this. It means motive and opportunity. How would the disciples have the means to overpower these trained Roman soldiers, to, to move this so, stone, break this seal? Uh, why would they have the means uh, or the opportunity to do this while it's being guarded in the night? And even the motive, why would they? You've really got to wrestle with that. These guys have been following Jesus for years and they've, their faith has been growing and they now believe he's the Messiah and the Son of God. Um, but they're ready to kind of lay their life down, die. Peter's getting the sword and cutting off a, 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 um, a guard's ear. But, but then things don't go the way they'd thought. Jesus surrenders to them. They run and they hide in fear. Peter denies him. Judas betrays him and kills himself. The others flee and are nowhere to be found. Um, they're running, they're hiding, they're confused. Why would these disciples steal the body, pretend he's raised from the dead, preach that message to hundreds and to thousands over the next coming, um, coming years, and actually die for their faith? We know from history, many of these disciples um, paid with their life, holding to this testimony that they'd seen the risen Jesus. But if it were all a lie, why would they die? And if if they'd really seen him die and really not seen him raised, 
then their faith was futile. Why would they lie about that in the first place? So these things just don't add up when we wrestle with those kind of thoughts. But here they're, they're, they're coming up with this lie and they're trying to explain it away because again, they're trying to do everything they can to silence Jesus and his, in his entire ministry. But obviously you cannot stand against the power and the presence of God. He is working and he is moving and he cannot be stopped. Let's finish off Matthew 28 and the entire book. In verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Who comes to them? The 11 disciples, obviously the 12 minus Judas, coming to the mountain. He told them to go. When they arrived, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I, I love the inclusion of that detail. Amongst these core 11 disciples who have been with Jesus so intimately, some of them are still doubting. Now we could judge that and accuse them. How could you be doubting of seeing the risen Christ? But I love that inclusion of that detail because amongst these core super apostles, and I use that tongue in cheek, <laughs> the idea of super apostles, but um, men we look up to and respect, these giants of the faith, even at this point, they're still doubting. They're still wrestling. They still have questions. They're still a bit confused, perhaps. That gives me hope. When I have doubts, when I'm unsure, Perhaps that could give you hope coming to the end of this study. Maybe you still have questions. You still have doubts. That's okay. Even the 11 have doubts. Let's keep seeking, keep looking for answers and keep wrestling. And I think that stands in complete contrast to the chief priests who aren't seeking. They're not looking for answers to, wait a minute, Jesus' body isn't there. What's really happened? They're just looking for excuses and justifications and trying to get that truth gone. Let's have a heart to seek truth not to look for um, look for ways not to believe. But Jesus says he's got all authority on heaven and on earth. Every ounce of authority belongs to him. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. He is truly sovereign over all. And he gives the great commission. He says for them to go and make disciples. What Jesus has been doing throughout all these chapters of Matthew, he'd called his disciples. And if you remember back to Matthew 4, he says, I will make you fishers of men. And this is the fulfillment of that. He's now sending them out to be these fishers of people. But he's taught them. He's equipped them. He's loved them. He showed them uh, what it means to be um, to be a follower. He's, he's showed them that standard. He's set them an example. And now he calls them to live it out. And he calls them to go and make disciples of others. And not just of the Jewish people, but of all nations. The promise that Abraham way back in Genesis is finally being fulfilled. That he was, his, his generation, his descendants would be a blessing to all nations. This has always been God's plan for his people to bless the nation, to be a blessing to the world around them. That's the calling of us as disciples as well, to disciple all nations, um, to invite everybody into a relationship with God and to enjoy the bountiful blessings that exist within his kingdom. But there are a few specific details. And again, what it means to be a disciple is to be a follower, is to be a student. It means this Christian and disciple mean the same thing. Acts 11.25 tell us that. Uh, there aren't standards of commitment in discipleship. And Jesus has made it very clear to us what it means to be his disciples. Wholehearted commitment. He is number one. He is first. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross and we follow him. That's the calling of discipleship, this wholehearted commitment. We're now called to go and share that with other people. It also says to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has now died, been buried, and raised again. In baptism, in full submersion, we die with him. We are buried, and as we come out the waters, we're raised to the new life, receiving the forgiveness of our sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There's much teaching on that throughout the rest of the New Testament. It's in Acts 2.42. It's Peter's response when the crowd ask him. They hear about the death and resurrection of Jesus and they ask, what should we do? Peter tells them, repent and get baptised for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is part of Jesus' great commission here. 
And then it says to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Teaching them to obey, not just teaching information. I've mentioned this several times throughout our study. I don't just want this to be an academic exercise. We looked at our SPEAK acronym every time. A sin to avoid, a promise to hold, an example to follow, an action I'm called to, and knowledge of God. Because we don't just want information, we want application. How are we being changed? How are we being transformed from the inside? Not just outwardly obeying religious commands or example, ritual, going through rituals, going through the motions, but really being transformed inwardly from the heart. We too are called to be teachers. As we learn about him, as we commit to following him, we are also called to teach others, to help others. We also continuously need that teaching and that help. Um, teaching to obey, it's not natural to us. Our flesh fights and we don't want to deny ourselves and take up our cross. We want to indulge ourselves in our flesh. We need the help of each other. We need that constant, ongoing teaching. He says, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Talked a bit about the end of the age before. Perhaps that doesn't mean the end of this age, but his clarification, I'm with you always. And again, as I've mentioned, when we're baptised, when we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God's presence really goes with us at all times. We, as individual disciples, but as the church community, become the new temple where God's Spirit dwells with us. That concludes the Gospel of Matthew. And I want to ask you, um, what have you got as we've studied out this book together? What are some of the big lessons you've learned? What in your heart, in your life has changed? Um, or perhaps what needs to? Perhaps uh, write in the comment section, um, what were some of the big chapters that stood out to you? The biggest lessons you'd learned? Perhaps questions that still hang. It's okay even to have those questions and doubts we see from the disciples. Pop some of those in the comment section. It would be great to hear from you and great to hear your thoughts. But thanks so much for persevering with us uh, through this whole study and finishing out the book of Matthew. And well done as well with that. Let's look at one final SPEAK acronym to see what we could gather from this chapter together. A sin to avoid. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to name this more specifically, but I think just a hardening of heart. Again, a pride, an arrogance, but a, an ignorance willfully. The chief priests have had so much opportunity and so many, so many chances to repent. And even here, the risen Christ, they still won't repent. They're still looking for other solutions not to believe and, and not to follow this Messiah. Even at the risen Christ, they come up with this solution. They, they lie and say it's, it was the disciples who stole the body. Again, let's have honest hearts to seek truth. It does often require change, a change of our worldview, a change of our paradigms, a change of action and, and heart and behavior. But let's make the change that's necessary. Make the change that God is calling us to. Let's soften our hearts. Let's continue to seek truth. To have doubts is okay, but to willfully choose ignorance and harden our hearts to the truth is definitely not okay. Uh, a promise to hold. I think verse 20, the final verse here, is an encouraging promise. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. God's presence can go with us. He wants to be with us and wants to, to, to live with us. An example to follow, well, I think the disciples, even though some of them are doubting here, uh, when we read the rest of the pages of the New Testament, and this also from our history books, we see that these, these really ordinary men follow Jesus to their very last dying breath. They commit their lives. If things are transformed, they truly do obey everything he's commanded them, and they truly do go out and make more disciples as well. Let's follow their incredible example. An action I'm called to, go and make disciples. Very clear command here. It's not an optional extra. If we want to be a Christian, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, this is integral to, to what that is. It's different from our purpose. Our purpose is to know God. The Emmanuel agenda, him wanting to be with us, us being with him is very much the purpose of mankind. But our mission as disciples is to go and make more disciples, is to spread the message of his kingdom, to share his love and his bountiful blessings with others. And let's obey that calling. And finally, a knowledge of God. He wants all people to know him. This has been the message from the very start of Genesis to the very last page of Revelations. And the very start of the book of Matthew, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. God desires to be with us. He desires to know you and to know me, to have a relationship with us, to call us into community, relationship with each other and with our incredible God. 
let's respond to that amazing calling to be his disciples, to be with him and to know him, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And let's pray right now. Dear Father God, um, as we come to the end of the book of Matthew, we just want to thank you so much for all that we've been able to learn, all that we've been able to study in this book. I pray, God, that you bless everybody who is listening um, right now, everybody who has been a part of this study um, and just looked into your scriptures. I pray give them wisdom, give them insight, show them, Lord, what you want of their lives and where you're calling them to. Open up the pages of scripture, make it come alive in us, God, and help us to have the courage, the humility um, to follow you. Give us pure and honest hearts that continue to seek truth, that continue to seek you in everything we do. Help us to respond to this incredible calling of being your disciples and going out to make more disciples as well and to share your bountiful blessings with others, Lord. Uh, as we come to the end of the pages of scripture, just make clear, bring things to the surface that we need to be able to work on and grow in or things that we just need to understand. Maybe things we need to still hear maybe still continuously hearing the message of your love and you desiring to be with us, hearing the words that you are willing, Lord, uh, that you draw close to us. Uh, we love you so much, God. We thank you and we pray in your son's name. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today in Matthew 28, but for all of this study as well. I do hope you have a fantastic day today and also tomorrow when I won't see you for another video, uh, but I wish you all the best. Please do pop in the comment section not only from today, but from this whole study. Uh, what were some of the big things that stood out to you? Some of the best insights that you received from the scriptures as you studied them? Perhaps questions that still remain or other insights that we weren't able to cover. I wish you all the best. I hope you have a great day. See you soon.